Hello and welcome to Trends in Marketing, Anticipating the Future with Dr. Jagdish Sheff. My name is John Christensen. I'm the host and moderator for this series in which Dr. Sheff discusses how marketing is changing to reflect shifts in demographics, technology, competition, globalization, and public policy. Dr. Sheff is the Charles H. Kelstep Professor of Marketing in the Goey's Way to Business School at Emory University and founded the University's Center for Relationship Marketing. Dr. Sheff's passion and his fascination with marketing have made him one of the preeminent leaders in customer satisfaction, global competition, and strategic thinking. At the end of this presentation, Dr. Sheff will answer questions. And now, here is Dr. Jagdish Sheff. Thank you, John, for that very nice introduction. I'm very glad to be here. Today's topic and my presentation has to do with trends in marketing, anticipating the future. Before I talk about the presentation, let me also mention that I have a very informal, highly conversational style. Please call me Jag, like in Jaguar. And ever since that association, I've been dreaming of owning a Jaguar with a license plate, Jag's Jag. Actually, the dream became a reality five years ago when I turned 60. I'm 65 now. And I always talk about Jag and Jaguar. I have two grown-up children. Both are in Atlanta. And they surprised me. I don't count my birthdays. It was Saturday morning. I went out, got my newspaper, turned around, and saw a beautiful Jaguar top of the line in the driveway with a handwritten license plate, Jag's Jag. Unfortunately, it was a rent -a car I still don't have a Jaguar, OK? Uh, I do this routine so you get used to my southern accent. Do you detect the southern accent? That's really what I talk about primarily so that people get used to my southern accent. Trends in marketing anticipating the future is very, very important primarily because most marketing successes are by accident. I've been absolutely amazed as to how many marketing successes have been strictly by accident being at the right time at the right place. I'll give you some quick examples. When the cell phone industry was created in mid 80s, it was a World War II technology, military technology. Bell Labs had created that one. Government allowed them to commercialize. And I was working at that time, and we had outside consultants who made a forecast that by the year 2000, there will be less than 800,000 or 900,000 subscribers in the US. We missed that forecast slightly. In fact, today, if you look at the cell phone market, it has already surpassed the regular landline telephone lines. The largest single market, in fact, is not even the US. It is China, 240 million subscribers with, in fact, only 11% penetration. Second largest market is likely to be India. It is growing at about 90% a year. They are adding close to, in fact, six to seven million new subscribers every year. Europe is the second largest right now with about 200 million subscribers. And in US, we are about 140 million subscribers with about 60% penetration. So we made a wrong forecast there. Success came by accident. If you believe that is a more recent phenomenon, this is true all along. Intel, as another company, was struggling. They were primarily making a 8-bit processor, about to go to 16-bit processor. And their customers were mostly companies like Intel, Atari. Remember those names? They're all gone, basically. So their customers were declining. That whole industry was taken over by Japanese manufacturers, such as Sony more recently, or Nintendo. Intel as a chip maker was struggling very hard. Out of nowhere, IBM discovers them. Even though IBM was the largest single semiconductor maker at the time, bigger than Motorola National Semiconductor and the Texas Instrument put together, but IBM competency was primarily for mainframe computing, not at the PC level. And therefore, this 8-bit processor going to 16-bit processor, then 32, now 64, rest is the history. 
Intel out of nowhere became the single largest chip maker in the world. I find not only most marketing successes are by accident, but surprisingly more than half of those successes are despite marketing plans. In other words, if the company had followed the marketing plans in terms of executing their marketing programs, either the product would have died or it would not have succeeded to the same level. The best story I can talk about that one is a Ford Mustang. I don't know whether you know, but Ford Mustang is actually one of the longest surviving models in the world. It recently surpassed Model T, which was also a Ford Motor Company, started in 1908 and continued forever. And of course, more recently, Volkswagen Bug just sold more units before they're going to close down that line compared to Ford Mustang. So Mustang was an extraordinarily highly successful new product introduction. But the company's original plans were targeted toward young adults. The definition of young adults would be 16 or 17 to about 21 years old. They had done a complete research that they needed a car that they were identified with. Marketing plans were excellent. They decided to create a word of mouth communication by giving out the Mustang car, driven in fact freely by college co-eds and flight attendants. You notice the car one way or the other. And in fact, before the car was even rolled out in 1964, all of the studies clearly showed that in the target market, more than 90% of the young adults knew there was a new car coming out by name Mustang and also by the corporate name Ford as a motor company, by and large. Everything was just right, except they forgot one little detail. More than 93% of the targeted audience never bought a new car. It was absolutely the best car designed. They had to build a whole new assembly plant. It looked like a sports car, a two-door, long hood, short deck by and large, and emulated very much like, let's call it a Corvette in America, or a Porsche or something like that. Very unusual for its time. Car was priced very right, only $2,500, which was relatively inexpensive for its time let's say to an average price of about 3,500 or 4,000 for a typical Chevrolet uh, Impala, which was the largest selling big automobile. Interestingly, Ford also was doing all the market research after the big failure of Edsel that identified a number of dealers out there who will go out and measure the demographic profile of the customer who bought new cars, maybe about 1,000 dealers or so, they're getting results from the dealer saying that the person who is buying Ford Mustang is not the young adult, but his dad or her dad. People in their 40s were buying this car, not the young adults. Fortunately, Ford decided to look into the research, change the whole game around, and began to target the car toward the more mature, older, what we call the baby boomer today, in fact, as the individual changed the whole media plans, changed the campaign primarily. In fact, I've even seen commercials in magazines like Time, Business Week, which are all sort of the white collar professional business magazines, where the comment would be more like the old saying we had, remember, like father, like son. This is a reverse thing, like son, like father, where they will show you, in fact, to say, look, Think about what your son is able to do today in terms of dating, in terms of, you know, outside excitement, by and large. You can vicariously live that life today, in fact, by having a Mustang. First year sales would have been otherwise less than 85,000. On a three-year plan, which is what the automobile does, the break-even point was about 220,000 per year for three years, and the car actually sold more than 400,000 uh, models, in fact, more than 400,000 cars first year out essentially and became a success. In fact, today there might be even a cult behavior toward those original Mustang owners, just like we have a cult behavior to our Harley Davidson, for example, or even a Volkswagen Bug. Interestingly, if the company had followed the plan, they would have never done very well. I can go on giving you other stories, but let me add just one more around here which is my favorite. I worked on this, actually. It's a after-shave lotion called high karate. 
High karate, most of the young people will not even know this name, again a 60s phenomenon, is a success by accident and despite marketing plans. High karate was introduced by Pfizer in their over-the-counter OTC drug business. It was targeted at a given price point. While we do a lot of demographic and psychographic research in aftershave lotion and uh, uh, let's say, you know, cologne market, surprisingly, most demographics just don't work anymore. By the way, the largest single buyer of aftershave lotion is not the man, but the woman. And in fact, they buy aftershave lotion in a traditional grocery store or at best, in fact, a drugstore. You cannot really look at the demographics and decide this is the segment I will target or this is another segment I will target. Only way you can segment the market in aftershave lotion is by price. You have a price point called 99 cents or below, brand names like Aqua Velva. Remember Aqua Velva? Mermaid theme in those days? Or in fact, a brand name called Menon, Bracer, Skin Bracer. Those, dom those brands dominated, they are really high volume, low price brands, and you can get it in a supermarket uh, shelf primarily, maybe drugstores. The next category is about brands that begin at one and a half dollars in those days, till about five dollars. And the dominant brand there was Brut. No, I'm sorry, it was Old Spice. After Shave Lotion called High Karate was introduced at that price point, Surprisingly, Old Spice was not advertising. Timing was accidentally right. Suddenly, High Karate took a huge share of that segment, price segment. Then there's a, another price point at $5 that goes $5 to $10, and the biggest brand then would be Brut. But there'll be brands like Jade East, for example, British Sterling. There are a bunch of brands in that category. Brut dominates, which is sort of what we call the premium and then, of course, there's a whole segment that buys more, in fact, uh, boutique uh, perfumery brands, such as Chanel for men, kind of a thing, beginning at $40, $45. High karate succeeded enormously. Now, what we do in marketing is also very fascinating. When a product succeeds, everybody takes credit. Ad agency thought they did a great job about having this very sexy commercial, which was very racy for its time, Karate chops, this young man, all women are chasing. That was sort of a unusual in for its time. The brand manager thought the branding was very right. The packaging people thought they had a great, good packaging. The fragrance people thought they did a great job of having the right fragrance, etc. By the way, I have tested the product. It is not that great. I have a whole bunch of boxes of these products. I used to do a lot of research with my MBA students at Columbia University using that particular brand as to why it failed. In fact, I like to do post-mortems. Why a given product failed miserably. In this case, it succeeded, but succeeded by accident despite management. Because it went into a segment where there was no counter competitive pressure by the big company in this case would be in fact Old Spice. By the way, Old Spice came back eventually with a sailor theme, counterbalancing high karate. But once you succeed in this sort of the packaging goods industry, especially cosmetics and uh, you know, perfumes, the notion is that if a customer is willing to buy this product, maybe we can migrate the customer, it's called cannibalization, by offering another brand name at higher price points where margins will be much greater. So they introduced a second brand called Black Belt. Get it? High Karate, Black Belt. Fascinating, Black Belt died. It did not take the market away from High Karate. High Karate continued in that segment. And in fact, Black Belt went into the next price point where the distribution is very, very different. Now we have to go through department stores and the Pfizer over-the-counter company had no strength in the department stores. They knew how to deal with drug stores, how to deal with grocery stores. And of course there, Brut was waiting. Market was already crowded with more than half a dozen good brand names. Consumer loyalties are much stronger there. They are not looking for value, but they're looking for some psychological benefit they are getting. And Black Belt died in the process. So I was brought in along with a student uh, from, from Columbia University, and we did the postmortem. As I told you, I enjoy postmortems. And we finally figured out 
that the real segmentation in this industry is only by price. And I find, by the way, in most industries, price is the best way to segment the market, not psychographics, not demographics, not personality traits. We all exaggerated that stuff pretty much. Given these experiences, I've really begun to appreciate that marketing can be improved as a discipline and as a practice if we really begin to look into the future, look at the external drivers that drive the marketing successes. Marketing is not in the control of marketers, but in the control of the customers, the environment, the competition, whatever it is out there. It is just like stock market. No matter how much you do back, back testing on a given model, when you really create a live portfolio, you don't know whether you will win in that portfolio better than a benchmark, let's say S&P 500 or Dow Jones. It's the same thing about marketing. Marketing is, unfortunately, too much dealing with uncertainty. And therefore, the best model around here is back to future. If you can anticipate the future and look at from that viewpoint and begin to actually, in fact, understand how marketing should be deployed, hopefully we'll have more successes. So marketing is all about anticipating and managing customers and competition. In other words, if you can anticipate where customers are likely to be, or if you can anticipate where competition is likely to be, and plan accordingly, we are more likely to succeed than would be any other way. In fact, this is very much like Wayne Gretzky, one of the best hockey players used to be, uh, he was asked, why are you so great? What makes you so great? And his answer was always say, I don't skate to where the puck is, but I skate to where the puck will be, in fact. That's anticipation. And hence, you always scored much better than anybody else on the uh, hockey field, ice hockey field, for example. The company that does very well about anticipating customers and competition, especially competition, is Microsoft. Microsoft is, on the one hand, a highly opportunistic company. Excellent company, strong cash flow, deep pockets, excellent R&D department, but they are probably the best fast followers. For example, they realized that the world will go toward PC architecture, personal computers, as opposed to mainframe computers, and jumped into that one and had a great relationship with Intel and Microsoft together, what's called Wintel, made a huge success out of Windows, and any other operating as well as application software they have come out, they've really dominated the market. Now they're watching, of course, the evolution of the internet. When Netscape, Netscape came out as the first internet browsing company, they jumped into that one, and today, again, Microsoft dominates that business. They have also understood that any access is very important, so they have jumped into the PlayStation 2 type models, such as you know, Sony's PlayStation 2, Nintendo, and have come out with the Xbox. They do the same thing, in fact, with regard to the cell phones. They are trying to create a de facto standard against, let's say, Nokia or Qualcomm. They have done the same thing with set-top boxes on cable television. And in fact, more recently, they have basically announced an alternate standard to take the standard away from Palm which is the architecture for PDA, because that, again, is an information access device. They are in the business of controlling or offering benefit to the customers at that access point. Make it easier as much as possible, make it as affordable as possible, and make it as accessible as possible. So Microsoft seems to be always anticipating where competition and customers are going to go and plan out their whole marketing plans accordingly. It is one of the better companies that I have seen in terms of fast following trend, whether it's a customer trend, such as for example, most of the business customers are really going less and less toward the legacy systems, proprietary systems, let's say by IBM or by IBM competition, and more and more toward the internet architecture. So they wanna play in the internet game in the enterprise market and they're doing a great job. Another company that seems to be doing very well about anticipating customers and competition is Cisco. I'm deliberately choosing examples here that are not just consumer products examples where we dominate our thinking in marketing, but examples from services companies, examples from industrial companies, examples from, let's say, technology companies. Cisco, again, anticipated that the enterprise customers are likely to be more and more blessing the internet architecture. 
Prior to them, you had large companies like Lucent, Nortel, Alcatel, Siemens. These are very large companies continuing their journey with the traditional models or IBM on the other side the same way. Honeywell, IBM, those are the legacy companies in mainframe computing and Lucent, Nortel would be in the central office or switching area by and large. Cisco decided that the enterprise customers will always want an architecture that is cheaper and they came out with this whole routing mechanism and they've been very successful at that game. In fact, Cisco's revenues continue to increase in the process. Next area I wanna talk about is right positioning and targeting. In other words, if a company anticipates the future like Wayne Grusky and really positions for that future properly and targets its markets very well, it is likely to do better than simply playing Las Vegas game. In other words, take your chance. The companies that seem to do very well in terms of positioning targeting are companies like Marlboro Cigarettes in their younger days or Perrier Water. Marlboro Cigarettes is a very fascinating case history. We can learn quite a lot from these old case histories in many ways because they're repeated again and again in newer industries, in newer marketplaces. Marlboro Cigarettes was first filter cigarette Therefore, it was primarily patronized by women who had just started to smoke. Competition was by companies like Lucky Strike, Pall Mall, Camel Cigarettes, very harsh because they were non-filter cigarettes. Women were able to smoke Marlboro, but the company decided that women as a target segment is not going to create a large revenue volume for them. Women will be casual smokers at best not heavy smokers, and they decided the whole thing reposition by, in fact, creating the Marlboro Cowboy Country. Out of that one, surprisingly, the company began to now identify the cigarette with the macho appeal, the male market, and became number one brand. In fact, I've seen commercials of Marlboro Cowboy theme from about 30 countries in the world, and it's absolutely fascinating where you see a Mexican cowboy, an Italian cowboy, along with an American cowboy. It's just fantastic, in fact, commercials they've produced. And of course, the ad agency that made those commercials has been uh, given a lot of recognition for, uh, like the Clio Awards, for example. They won in those younger days, by and large. Marlboro, even today, is number one cigarette brand in the world. While the whole cigarette industry is declining, by and large, because we are becoming less and less smoking society, by and large, Marlboro still has a strong, strong, powerful positioning, which they did very, very well, appealing to this underlying uh, conquering nature by hand, the macho appeal, and that seems to be universal worldwide, surprisingly, uh, despite all of our research about cross-cultural differences, it begins to rise above that. Perrier Water is another great company. Again, they de decided that here is a product that is available free. You can get water from the water tap. You can get water from the well, for example. But Perrier decided that there was a trend emerging that some educated people are less likely to drink as much. Excessive drinking was considered a taboo, just like smoking we have as a taboo now. Decided there was a market primarily to target Perrier, which is a sort of a, a bubbly water, essentially. Put it in a bottle and make it into an adult cocktail drink, people who are teetotalers and don't want to actually drink any liquor, wine or beer, this was an alternative. And it became a success in the process. So we actually can do very, very well in marketing, better than by chance, better than by luck, better than by accident, in fact, if you do the right positioning and the right targeting, anticipating the future. My Next area I want to talk about is how does, in fact, this anticipating the future as a starting point for creating marketing plans gives benefit to companies. The first major benefit that happens is that you, become, you are the first in the market. If you know a trend emerging and you can probably create a product according to that trend, you are likely to be first in the market. And I'll talk about three companies that have done very well, and I'll make my sh story short because we only have so much of time. Uh, the first one, of course, is the famous story about Sony Walkman. Remember, Sony began its journey as a transistor radio. 
at a time when most of the radios were wired, just like a landline telephone versus wireless telephone, it was the same thing. Sony got the technology, transistor technology again was a Bell Labs invented almost in the public domain. Sony's founders figured out that the world consists very largely of illiterate people, very largely of people where you don't have running water or electricity, wanted to create a mass market product and came out with a transistor radio, which was basically you could carry anywhere you go by and large with batteries. Walkman was the next evolution. The idea was that while we can carry the radios, they're very bulky. People don't want to carry them in their hands like boom boxes, for example. Why not have something that people can wear so their hands are free, they can do other things? And came out with Walkman, which has been one of the best successes. And by the way, they're doing the same thing with video technologies now, as opposed to just the audio, like a radio technology by and large. Better story than Sony, I think, probably the best story I have come across about first to the market and really winning big by anticipating the trend is Walmart. Think about a company that emerges from a small town called Bentonville, Arkansas. Small retailer, trying to compete against incumbent giants who were highly respected in the days, such as Sears or Walmart. In fact, I mean, or Kmart. The name Walmart came about because the founder, Sam Walton, was so much respectful of Kmart's success against Sears. And he wanted to emulate what Kmart did. But he decided that he would go into a market that nobody was paying attention, which turns out to be small towns, under 15, 20,000 population. Neither Sears nor Kmart could ever see economics in the way they organized this business to serve this particular market. So the genius here was actually marketing execution. Coming out with an architecture where you will be able to offer best brand names to the small town consumers. People used to laugh at this gentleman and would say, how can you compete against giants like Sears, Montgomery Ward, JCPenney, Kmart? And he had a very simple answer. His answer was, hit them where they ain't. And the rest is history. Aggregating demand from small towns, coming out with, in fact, a logistical system, hub and spoke, as it is called, putting technology behind called VSAT technology, which is a very small aperture, data communication, satellite-based network, by and large. They have now become the largest single retailer in the world, and probably they will cross easily $250 billion in revenue and they've already surpassed biggest companies in the world, such as General Motors, Ford, or even General Electric in revenues. Walmart is now expanding beyond domestic market into England, Canada, Mexico, Germany, Japan, is becoming a global enterprise. Again, the format is the same, surprisingly, and they're doing a very good job. So I believe that there is an opportunity out there. If you can just learn where it is and anticipate, I think one can do a good job. Similarly, there was a trend emerging in the 60s, began in the 70s as a major avalanche. People were having no time to go out and eat. They wanted more convenience. They wanted delivery at home. And out of nowhere, a company comes about called Domino's Pizza. Nobody thought about Domino's Pizza. It was such a small little company. You had incumbent players such as, for example, Pizza Hut, very successful chain. There were other alternatives to Pizza Hut in those days, and they were entrenched. The tra traditional format was that people will come and eat here, maybe at best have a takeout. But nobody thought about the emerging opportunity of actually home delivery, guaranteeing home delivery, and Domino Pizza out of nowhere has become number two pizza company. Pizza Hut is not able to duplicate, then, in fact, what they have done. Even McDonald's, which has been a very successful corporation otherwise, has not been able to do home delivery. And Domino survives in the process and actually makes enormous money. So we talked about the advantages this gives you if you anticipate the future by being first to the market and in the process, take the largest market share and continue to grow. Now, it does not mean that pioneering is always advantageous. I don't buy that argument at all. In fact, in many, many high technology industries. 
the first mover advantage only happens if a second mover is not able to come in or is not allowed to come in, such as in the drug industry. If I come out with a new drug, then unfortunately nobody else can follow me because I have patent rights, and therefore I get a monopoly power, and therefore a first mover advantage comes in. Or, in fact, if I am the first mover, and competition is not able to duplicate what I do, such as Sony technology in Walkman, Walmart, in fact, strategy for going after the rural market, or Domino Pizza's home delivery, then there is first more advantage. On the other end, if the later entrants can move into the industry, then usually the first mores become pioneers, casualties, they die. It is the second wave of competitors who succeed in the marketplace. So the first major advantage is the first more advantage if the, there are no followers who can follow you. Second more important reason is that very often the industry is nascent. It really requires, in fact, creating the whole market. It is not an advantage to a given company, but it's an advantage, in fact, to the whole industry. So the industry comes together. I'll give you some quick examples of how that has happened. You talk about organic foods. Today, the trends are very much that people are less and less inclined to buy processed foods. They believe that going back to nature, green movement, whatever we call it, is very, very important. And the whole organic industry is being created, whether it's foods, beverages, wine, whatever it is, on a worldwide basis. So you can create a whole new category. Online shopping came the same way. Online shopping began with pioneering efforts by Amazon.com eBay, remember the eBay is an auction technology where people bid on products that they want to buy and sell, etc. It's just like a flea market in an electronic world or the internet age by and large. And more recently, in fact, a whole new category is created in an industry that otherwise was plateauing, dying, which is called Starbucks. Think about that one. You could get coffee at office free. Coffee is a relatively inexpensive drink. And all of a sudden, Starbucks creates a whole new category where it is not the coffee per se, but the ambience, a place to get together, a place to sit back and relax kind of a thing. And Starbucks is now one of the largest, in fact, and one of the most successful companies in that category. And of course, when you start a new category, there will be other imitators who will come about and start another set of chains behind you, by and large. The third major benefit, and one that I'm more passionate about, has to do with Marketing can also serve the society. I find very fascinating that if you look at all of the benefits of technology since the Industrial Revolution, it has only influenced, it has only benefited maybe 10 to 15 percent of the society. Even today, more than 80 percent of the population has no running water, let alone hot and cold water. More than 50% of the world population has never made a single telephone call even today. So all these technologies we brag about, all these technologies that have done a wonderful job in enhancing our quality of life or standard of living, has been beneficial to a small number of world population. And one of the key reasons why the rest of the world does not get the benefit of the technology is affordability. And today, therefore, we are driving very hard the concept to say, how can marketing serve the world's poor profitably? All kinds of initiatives are coming about. It is not offering the technologies in advanced countries created at very high prices in a trickle-down fashion to the emerging markets like China, India, Brazil, Indonesia, for example, but really creating innovation that is itself a low-cost and still profitable innovation. I find fascinating that most of the successful ventures in those emerging nations are from NGOs, non-profit organizations, non-government organizations. They have done a far better job, for example, stories about microcredit, where you give credits to illiterate women or illiterate people in general to make them entrepreneurs in small towns and villages in India or in Brazil or in China are just fascinating stories and those are all profitable businesses. So we are learning how to do that very well. I think mainstream marketing has to really understand, just like Walmart did, that the real large markets may not be in the metro areas with well-educated people, what we call the 
upper socioeconomic classes, but the real market opportunities where marketing can make money and serve the society is in fact in those rural markets, mass markets, illiterate markets, unaffordable markets, and we can still organize, innovate, and make money. And by the way, there are some fantastic stories in that area that I can talk about, but I don't have the time to talk about right now. I have seen this thing happen where in smallest villages in India, for example, companies will be selling tea. There'll be something like 500 agents going on a bicycle, walking on, you know, just by, by barefoot, in fact, carrying a bag of tea because tea is a daily consumption for everybody in India. Okay? Fascinating. I've seen the same thing with other product categories. So it's possible. Same thing is happening with another area called biogenetics. And again, in this area, I find, again, very appropriately that all pharmaceutical companies have invested in biotech companies. Governments are getting involved in terms of biogenetics after the DNA architecture we discovered. And the potential of that one to serve the society and to make money is absolutely mind-boggling. It is one of those industries which will have as big an impact going forward as computing industry had, let's say, since the 60s, by and large, in this country. So I do believe, in fact, that trends in marketing should be understood by anticipating the future. Future, in fact, is where the excitement is. And how do we anticipate the future? I find that there are five different areas which are all external that we can analyze and understand and understand each one of them in some in-depth manner. Today, we are going to talk primarily about demographic trends. Then we are going to follow that one up with technology trends. Then we are going to talk about, in fact, trends in globalization. We will also talk about trends that are happening in competition and trends in public policy where government comes in and requires certain things to be done, and how can we manage that? So let me just strictly uh, summarize the last chart I have here. It primarily talks about, for example, marketing opportunities and challenges are created by several external trends. And we will focus on these five trends as we go forward into this journey. I hope you've enjoyed so far, and we will start, of course, very quickly getting into the demographic trends and how they're going to impact the marketing of tomorrow, by and large. Thank you very much. One of the most fascinating demographics is aging of the population. In fact, all advanced countries with affluence are aging. America actually is not the oldest nation. The oldest nation from an aging viewpoint is Sweden. In fact, they've reached a point of no return, which means Swedish women cannot produce enough children to reproduce themselves, which means the only way out for them from a population decline is to invite the neighbors. But please don't invite Russians. They have forgotten the art of producing children also. It's creating a lot of social issues because if you invite people from high population production countries, let's say emerging nations, how do they assimilate? Interesting debate. More fascinating is not Sweden, but actually Japan. Japan is already the second oldest nation in the world. It is already 120 million in population. Sweden is a tiny little country from a population viewpoint. And more importantly, Japan has the highest life expectancy in the world, which means if you're born in Japan today, you will live longer than any other place. Talk about je double jeopardy there, right? By the way, have you heard of a smart toilet? You know, we talk about dumb toilets, as we know here, American Standard, our brands. In Japan, there's a brand name called Toto, T-O-T-O. -O. Smart toilet, they have deployed millions of those units, probably funded by the government. So I raised the question, what does it do? And the answer was, it does everything. You just sit there. It'll wash you, dry you, clean you but it'll also take your blood pressure and heart rate. Now it gets more interesting. So I raised the question, why are they doing this stuff? It's called, by the way, telemedicine also. 200 different manufacturers are involved in creating this new architecture. And Japan, it has become a necessity because as population ages, 
Most people don't drop dead when they age, they go through chronic diseases such as hypertension, diabetes, arthritis, etc. So they need a daily monitoring. And there are just not enough doctors and nurses to come and do the monitoring at home every day. So what they do is very interesting. Simply when they go to the bathroom in the morning, they get all the vital signs to see if the human being at home is doing very well. And the reason is that unlike in America, Japanese don't age in nursing homes or in uh, retirement communities, they age at home. Japanese children take care, in fact, of their parents. So aging at home requires this home technology, and that's why it's called the Smart Toilet Project. Just like what they did with VCRs and uh, DVDs, they're going to use the domestic market as a test base perfect the technology and market to the rest of the world because aging population is a common problem among all advanced countries. Why does a nation age? Obviously it ages for two reasons. One, either you have a lower birth rate or in fact you have very high life expectancy. The birth rate was the old driver. All of last century birth rate was the driver. It took its own toll for example, we are only producing about 1.6 to maybe 1.7 children per wom woman today in America. Guess how many children we produced in early 1900s, about 100 years ago? It was seven children per woman. Why so many children at that time and so few now? The answer is very clear. It's all economics again. In an agricultural economy, children are an asset. At the age of eight, nine, they become errand boys or Ellen girls. At 11, 12, they become full-fledged labor force. They help you as much in getting more out of the land as a resource for your economic survival and growth, typical farming economy. And interestingly, when you grow old, there was no social security, they take care of you. So children are an asset on the balance sheet. In fact, in many of the emerging nations like China and India, there's a saying in the rural market, farming market, that if you have four adult sons, you are the king of your village. Because girls get married, if you have four adult sons, they can take care of more things out of the farm, you become wealthy in the process. In other words, labor force becomes very valuable family asset along with the land. Well, today, in the industrial age, and now the information age, Guess what? Children are no longer on the asset side of the balance sheet. They've gone into the liability side of the balance sheet. Have you figured out how much it will cost if you have a child today? Have you done a net present value of having a child today? If you add four years of college education, the economists have estimated it is going to be about $240,000 to raise a child. And what do they give you in return? Headaches, heartaches. They don't take care of you anymore. Very fascinating, right? So as the society goes from agriculture to industrial, industrial to services, services to information age, generally population declines. Birth rate declines enormously. In fact, the lowest birth rate is not in America, primarily because we have a significant influx of immigrants who come here, and they come from countries where still the traditional family lower socioeconomic class dominates. That's why they come here to sort of the Horatio Alger syndrome, you know, make it big in America. It's the dream of everybody who comes to America. Interesting change. The lowest birth rates are in countries that you would not even believe. It is not even Japan, but turns out to be Italy, and turns out to be Ireland now. Think about that. Irish, I mean, Catholic countries. The lowest birth rate in the world among advanced countries is in Italy. Fascinating. We are trying to analyze why it is like 1.3 children per woman, one of the lowest in the world. And as you know, you need 2.1 to reproduce yourself, or to sort of exactly the same number. That was all the 20th century. Especially since World War II, we became economically very affluent, and therefore the birth rate began to decline enormously. Today, what drives is not lower birth rate, but higher, in fact, life expectancy. The life expectancy in this country was only about 37, 38 years, 100 years ago. 
today it is already, in fact, 76 years. Think about that, 76 years and growing. The fastest growing segment in America are centenarians, people who live to be 100 years or older. In the early days, as early as 60s, if you were a man and lived to be 60, there was a celebration. Life expectancy was so short. Today, everybody's into 60s. 60s is sort of a non-event. We only notice today when somebody says, I'm 100 years old. Then we begin to respect in awe of that person. By the way, we only had 2,500 people, centenarians, in 1950s, 60s. The last census that just came out in year 2000, it had grown to, would you believe, 55,000 centenarians. And by 2020, it'll be in hundreds of thousands, maybe close to a quarter of a million or half a million people who will be 100 years or older, living, breathing, active life. And have you noticed they all want to drive? Think about that. <laughs> They're not just going to be in Florida. They'll be everywhere. Isn't that fascinating? That's the driver of the next sort of activities, interests, next set of demographics, next set of psychographics, needs, wants of this older aging population we need to understand. By the way, the second fastest growing segment is 85 year or older. Today, the most powerful lobby is no longer any of the trade unions, including, uh, let's say, United Mine Workers, United, United Auto Workers, or even AFL CIO. It is AARP, American Association of Retired Persons. They have more lobby power. They have more clout over the politicians than anybody else because of the constituency they have. I found fascinating, by the way, TV Guide used to be the largest read magazine. Everybody got a TV Guide. But today, even more readership and circulation is a magazine called Modern Maturity offered as a part of the membership fee by AARP. Totally different world again. Isn't it fascinating? That's what we have to understand, where this older population is going to grow. One more point about the older uh, affluent, uh, uh, older population is that it is older and affluent. As I mentioned earlier, the silent majority where the bulk of these people are which are aging more, the baby boomers are getting into silent majority, silent majority into pre-war kind of a category. These people are the wealthiest in the nation. They have more wealth as well as more income, surprisingly more passive income coming from retirement income, which is bigger than most people's basic salaries in this country now. So these people are not poor. We should never ever connect to say, because somebody is older, they will need social security. Somebody is older, they will need all the assistance, uh, public assistance. Somebody is older, they will, therefore, they will need subsidies in, for example, healthcare. That's the old model of the industrial age. These people are wealthy and they know how to spend. In fact, if you look at the demographics of this country, the target market by all media and marketers used to be 18 to 34 year households. That was in the 60s. I remember the, all of the demographic shifts. Well, then we began to say, well, that's not the case. Next target market is 34 to 50. Today, the real target market for buying and shopping is 35 to 50 years old, and eventually will be from 50 to 65 years old. What happens with aging, therefore? We need to understand and how they create market opportunity. So here are the fundamental things that create market opportunities. One of the biggest things we worry about as we grow older is our health. So health consciousness and health conservation becomes, and health concerns becomes the largest single opportunity. Give you some size of this market. By the way, in 1980, healthcare was only 9.5% of the GDP in America. By 1990, it grew to 12.5%. By year 2000, it is more than 15%. And at that rate, if you look at the total amount of GDP in trillions, healthcare alone is about $1.7 trillion industry. $1.7 trillion is a lot of market. By the way, not only that, but 45% of all of the healthcare is spent in saving last one year of life. An additional 15% is spent in 
saving the first year of life, the baby that is born premature, for example, making sure that she or he survives. And because we are spending so much money, whose money are we spending? It is the government which is funding a lot of health care through Medicare, medical programs. Corporations are spending. In fact, corporations are now worrying about the pension liability they are carrying for providing health care benefits after retirement to people. And they're all capitating or controlling those expenses. So today, if you are terminally ill, the government says, I don't want you to die in a nursing home or in a hospital, because per daily cost, maybe at least four or $5,000. So they send you home. Now you come home, terminally ill, and you are a burden on your own family. Those grown-up children who both are working, they have their own stress, they have their own problems. So guess what you do? You discover Dr. Kavorkian. Have you heard about Dr. Kavorkian? By the way, Dr. Kavorkian basically was the first physician to say people should have the right to die gracefully on their own, which changes our basic value system now. I'm told there are more than a dozen states now who are now having uh, rules, regulations about euthanasia, taking your own life gracefully. That is nothing unusual in the rest of the world. In Asia, in many countries, taking your own life gracefully, peacefully, has been considered a noble act. So are we going to blur our values in the process? We don't know, interestingly. I do believe that just like divorce was a taboo 100 years ago, it was unthinkable. And we made divorce more and more acceptable today with the presumption that the first time marriages, at least 50% will go in divorce. It's like an accepted thing. We are going to have the same thing about euthanasia. That is a new value system that's coming in. That's a new concern of the society by and large. And by the way, when you break down that $1.7 trillion of the economy, which is healthcare oriented, significant part has to do with services, home services, for example. So we need to understand that thing. So here are the kinds of things that we are figuring out in the health area, pretty much. And that has to do, for example, if you, if you look at the healthcare area, uh, uh, the, the, the key things are uh, around here. I'm going to look into my, my own notes around here. People are now worrying about foods and beverages. Is the food I'm eating healthy or not healthy? Interesting, right? We have all this uproar against fast foods in the process. We are constantly worrying about what we eat. By the way, I find one of the best indicators for all trends is really look at the most popular nonfiction books. I watch those. Have you seen for the last, I don't know how many years, any book on diet, vitamins, prescription drugs is the hottest area? Magazines like Consumer Reports have started now newsletters on, on your health kind of stuff. That's a new market. People, wanna, people are very curious. People go on the websites. Of course, the first site most people use is for pornography. Guess what's the second site? It has to do with health information. And the forecast is that the health information will surpass people's interest in pornography. Very radical shift. So it's not just health care, but health consciousness certainly creating anxiety about the foods that we eat, the beverages that we drink. Is coffee safe anymore? Is Coca-Cola safe anymore? Kind of a notion. And people are switching their consumption to newer categories. For example, the fastest growing market in America is bottled water. Not because our tap water is bad, municipal water is bad, but we believe that bottled water actually purifies some of the chemicals and it is good for us. Second major area that is as an opportunity is, have you seen all of the direct-to-consumer prescription drug advertising? In fact, if you watch the national news, prime time, whether it's CBS, ABC, NBC, mark my words, 40 to 50% of all the commercials are now prescription drug commercials. All of a sudden, pharmaceuticals are now appealing to the consumers, which was unthinkable. They were called ethical drug manufacturers. They were not supposed to advertise at all. It is the doctor who will be the key opinion maker, the key decision maker. You as a patient probably would not have anything to do with which drug will you use. But today, the power is with the patient. And today, patient with all that information through advertising or through websites are going to the doctor insisting, I want that particular drug. Mind change there again, right? That's very fascinating. And by the way, it's so interesting. I just watched a typical news program 
a couple of days ago, and I found fascinating. Now, plastic surgery is not only popular, but people now have surgery shows where people come and brag about, just like you have the fashion shows. Isn't that interesting? The interview with the plastic surgeon was more interesting to me. He made two comments. He said, first of all, we never marketed ourselves before. We were worrying about creating this hype about surgery, plastic surgery. Today, the, he believes that marketing is absolutely critical. But he made a second comment, which is equally important in any marketing. He says, you know, people are running away with these wild expectations that one plastic surgery will com completely make them perfect human beings. And he's saying, how can I manage these unrealistic expectations, which is also a challenge for marketing at the same time. So we have talked about all this stuff. There's a lot more, in fact, we can talk about. For example, we have the whole issue about, I don't know how many of you remember, I'm an old man. I'm 65 years old, as I mentioned earlier. Fascinating, in my days when I did the research on prunes, people would not want to talk about prunes. In fact, we used to do motivation research, which says, if you ask people, they will never reveal their real intentions. So you do it indirect approach, projective techniques, focus group interviews, and people would avoid prunes. And indirectly, why people would avoid? Because it reminded them with the you know, wrinkles, the old age. There used to be a famous commercial which says, today the wrinkles, tomorrow the pits, trying to promote prunes. Raisins have gone through the same thing. Have you seen those dancing raisin commercials trying to create value, a functionally very good product, but people socially don't ac accept it anymore? Today, it is totally different. Prunes are in, raisins are in, publicly. People want to visibly consume them as if it's the right thing to do. In fact, prune industry has relabeled the product as dried plums to disconnect with any connotations people may have. One of the fastest growing markets, of course, is laxatives in the process, not the chemically based, but more, more and more natural. For example, there is an ingredient called isabgul, one place in the world really produces, which is India, one particular geography, like one state and within a state, one county produces 80% of the world supply. And if you get your Metamucil, for example, it is that ingredient and becoming more and more acceptable by and large. That is where the world is going. And the last area I wanted to talk about has to do, in fact, with uh, very clearly this older population don't want to be dependent on anybody. So it is no longer nursing homes. It is no longer even assisted living. It is independent living. They want to be independent at the same time. So we see how can we participate in this new market called independent living, where they want to be independent at the same time. So that's clearly one trend, health consciousness. Second major consequence of aging population is wealth preservation. As I mentioned earlier, the older population is also wealthy population. Even today, a typical factory worker older, after 20, 25 years of work he has done or she has done, typically it's a male, in a typical, let's say, you know, automobile factory, steel factory, probably has a network of about a quarter of a million dollars. Most of that is not liquid assets. What they have is a pension plan money, home equity. Have you seen the home equity market grow in the process? And they have a lot of life insurance in the old days, like a whole life policy, universal life policy, which has some surrender value. That's a lot of money per individual. In fact, the same family at one time would have only survival of four months because paycheck to paycheck, there would have enough savings. But today, with $240,000 of hidden wealth or illiquid wealth, they can survive almost, in fact, 10 years or eight years or some such like that. And financial institutions are learning how to leverage that equity market that they have, which means leverage their balance sheet, as I call it. Very large thing. By the way, everybody is into will and trust, therefore. We thought wills and trust were only for the wealthy individuals who did not know how to pass on their wealth to their children, and they needed expert advice. Today, every ordinary citizen in America has to have a will and a trust, which means wills and trust have become from specialty niche market to mainstream market. Interesting area. Right? More importantly, in fact, is the whole area that has to do with, um, uh, you know, uh, planned giving. More and more, these wealthy individuals, the silent majority that I talked about, 
don't want to give the wealth right now. In fact, they really don't trust the baby boomers they produced, because they believe baby boomers are such hedonistic class of people. If I give them any money, they're going to immediately buy a beamer and spend all the money, right? Remember, the silent majority has experienced a Great Depression and two wars, at least World War II. They know how bad it can get. So they're very cautious parting with money. They also don't want to depend on their children to take care of them, so they also say, I have to take care of myself. They know they're going to live longer and longer. So they control their wealth. They want to pass on the wealth after they die. It's called plant giving. In fact, every major charitable organization, whether it's a church or a university, has learned how to get gift giving more plant giving major activity. These are just the tips of the iceberg. I'm just telling you why it is so important to understand this particular area. And by the way, I find very fascinating, for the first time, the mortgage industry is learning how to do reverse mortgage, <laughs> which means house is already paid up. So now what you do is that you buy the house from the family. When they die, they will be living there till they die, but the house then goes to the mortgage company or some financial institution, and they get a monthly check now. They are cashing out, essentially. Totally different approach, which I think is a second major driver of you know, emerging market opportunity because of aging. Third is safety security concerns. More and more as you're old, you can't take care of yourselves. You're worrying about your environment. Who will protect you? So we have the rise of the gated communities enormously. And if you look at those gated communities, especially in California, in Florida, most of them are very wealthy retirees. Fascinating in the change that's taking place, right? I also find, surprisingly, and this is absolutely a surprise to me, I did analysis on gun registration, which means legally possession guns. While the same aging of the population is make motivating us to smoke less and less and less, from a peak of about 40 to 45 percent of the adult smoking, it is down to about 15, 16 percent. It will go down even further as we make smoking a taboo gun possession is on the rise. In fact, today there are more adults possessing gun than smoking cigarettes. Isn't that fascinating? That's what the change is all about. And the last data that's happening about safety security has to do with all of the protection services. In fact, high net worth people now are having protection services, just like you have it in, let's say, Nigeria, or you have it in Brazil, or you have it in emerging countries. Today, if you are in New York City, high net worth individual, you probably need a shadow bodyguard, in fact, to take care of yourself. Especially in certain industries where physical violence, abduction can take place. We have seen several incidents recently, in fact, how wealthy families are abducted for, for basically ransom of some sort, by and large. Next area has to do, in fact, with uh, changing recreation preferences. This is my favorite. <laughs> Think about the following. The fastest growing, by the way, there are two kinds of recreations, active and passive. Let's take active recreation. You know, when I'm, when I'm age 18, contact sports is great, football, basketball. But at age 40, it hurts a lot, okay? So we give up the contact sports. In fact, tennis is too strenuous even now. Tennis is on the way down in the process. Tennis was the hottest new event that took place in the 60s and the 70s. Today, the most popular, in fact, recreation is golf. Like Wilson Trust, golf used to be a country club phenomenon. Only wealthy people could afford that one. But today, golf is a major, major active recreation by majority of the people in America. Not just the older people, but everybody. No one would have ever thought that golf would become a prime time television event in the same league as NFL, football, or basketball. Isn't that fascinating? They even delay 60 minutes kinds of news on Sunday because you have a golf tournament going on. On the weekends, you see nothing but golf. There is a separate golf channel on cable now, right? Golf is more general golf courses. Public golf courses are increasing enormously as opposed to country club golf courses. I think that's another major, major change. Let's talk about the passive recreation. You know, in the old days, we had family at home, young children, so we watched all of the typical family situation comedies. How many of you remember I Love Lucy, or My Three Sons, or my favorite was Ozzy and Harriet, for example? They're all gone. In fact, the only place you can see those programs are on Nick at Nickelodeon. Remember that even you know, the reruns are coming in? That's the only place you can watch those anymore. 
In fact, on CBS in the 60s and the 70s, the anchor used to be Sunday night at Sullivan, so a family show. On NBC was always, in fact, a Disney movie, and ABC had something very similar. All of them are gone now. In fact, Carol Burnett's show that came on CBS also couldn't survive too long. You cannot revitalize that anymore. Interest is no longer the same. When I am older person with, in fact, no children at home, my whole interest shifts in terms of what I want, want, want to watch. Interestingly, I call it reality programming, not of the kind that we see right now, but reality programming where on real world situations, it is drama that I create such as ER, emergency room, law and order, for example, cops chasing, you know, uh, the culprits kind of a thing. People are into that stuff because that appeals to them. That is the daily life they're leading in. For example, court shows, have you seen those things? All rising because I'm into courts more and more, legal systems of this country that affects my life kind of a thing. Very fascinating area. I found the same thing on, uh, on not only just on television, by the way, 60 minutes became more popular than Ed Sullivan show. But I find the same on radio. ABC had a radio which was around rock and roll music. Big stations like in Chicago will be WLS or in Los Angeles, they had a KBC, for example. They all had to change to, would you believe, 24-hour talk shows or 24-hour news. A CBS radio went into news, ABC went into talk shows. Who is more popular today? Dr. Laura Schlesinger, who actually is nothing more, nothing less than in many ways, Dr. Ruth Westheimer, remember? In the anonymity of a broadcast, isn't that fascinating? We want to reveal everything about our personal lives today, whether it's our sexual life or family tensions. Basically, therapy is done on the radio. So are financial news on the radio. So is the health on the radio. If you look at CNN, you find now there's a health doctor, for example, who has a column of his own. This is the new world that we are dealing with, by and large, and we need to capitalize on that particular world, by and large. That's the point I'm making. And by the way, I forecasted even golf will be gone. Down the road, the fastest growing recreation is going to be walking. We already have walking shoes, as distinct from running shoes. We will have walking uh, marathons, just like we have running marathons. Already many older people are walking in the shopping malls in the morning in groups. So walking is the new major recreation. And we're going to have, again, prime time television programs telling us about the, all the niceties about how to walk right. You know, what are the dangerous things you should not do, all the stuff, just as we do right now, in fact, with about running, marathon running, or with the golf ball. I find it very fascinating. So that's the recreation. The next area that I want to talk about is that these people want to see the world before they can physically disabled. They have a lot of money. So cruise ships are totally dependent on them. In fact, majority of the cruise ships, airlines are catering, especially vacation packages of the airlines they offer. Every major airline has a wholesale company that is like, you know, Delta vacations or Qantas vacations. And they put together a package. And today, what you see when you travel are a lot of older people, including in wheelchairs, wanting to see the world, whether it's the pyramids, the seven wonders of the world, or whatever it is. So these people are not just staying at home but they're totally very active, affluent, older population is coming in. I'm even told that some of the people really have no homes anymore. They're strictly in mobile homes. 50,000 families are like that, and they have a mail address system in different locations where they will end up. They don't have a, a typical home. They're living in a mobile home and moving around constantly. That is the life by and large, you know? Let's talk about the next area, which is another market opportunity that is emerging, which has to do with family bonding. You know, at one time, our definition of a family was a nuclear family, which means I bonded with my kids and my wife as a, as a husband. Today, family bonding is taking through grandchildren. Disney World is capitalizing on this enormously by appealing to grandparents. Most of the will and trust is passing on the wealth to grandchildren. Funding grandchildren's education, for example. And you see a very interesting phenomenon, which I will talk about again, but I find all demographics are not linear, but they are circular, which means what began continues for a while, but it turns back again the old way. I now see a trend in America where older parents are living back with their grown-up children and grandchildren, back to the 
extended family. Remember the old extended family? Italians were famous in the Western world. It's very true in Asia, for example. That's the kind of an approach. Bringing the parents back so they can give the good values to the grandchildren rather than rely on babysitters or latchkey kid phenomenon, etc. rather than having a maid taking care of them. Very fascinating change we are going through. And the last major opportunity I'll talk about is that as we grow older and especially affluent, we begin to go inward searching for ourselves, our identity, who we are. We call it self-actualization. And spirituality is rise. By the way, the fastest growing religion in America today is Buddhism. It is not Islam. It is not Christianity. It is not, in fact, any of the Western religions. It is Buddhism. Because Buddhism is more introspective. It is almost like Hare Rama, Hare Krishna movement that started and then fizzled out. But Buddhism is at the individual level. Understanding who you are, meaning of life, why were you born, these are the things people do when they grow older and especially when they're affluent older. And that's what we see. So, and the rise in the sale of books on spiritual books. So authors like Deepak Chopra, who was a very famous, in fact, uh, medical doctor, but he had alternate medicines like yoga and others than traditional medicine. Began to write books primarily about, for example, quantum healing was his first book. But today, he's much more into search for God, who is God. And that's appealing to the masses. Those are becoming bestsellers. So to summarize, all affluent nations are aging. Japan is the oldest nation, or will be sec is, is second oldest, but will become the oldest nation. And we are aging more and more, not because of lower birth rate, but because we are living longer and longer. Fastest growing segment in America, therefore, is centenarians, people really to be 100 years or older. And the second biggest growing segment is 85 year old, older segment, by and large. This change brings about enormous market opportunity and challenges, and we talk about five, six major opportunities. First one has to do with the rise in health consciousness and health concerns. Healthcare is the single largest uh, industry in the process. Second one we talked about was the wealth preservation. People are now not just driven by paycheck, but their wealth, which is the balance sheet as opposed to income statement, as I call it. And people are saying, how can I preserve, protect my wealth and make more money on my passive income that I generate, more money on the money that I have, whether it's in the stock market, whether it's in the real estate, it's not from the wages, which is why jobless recovery is not a problem in America. In other words, there's a whole theory in economics called permanent income hypothesis. That's the second thing we are thinking about. Third thing is that as we grow older, we worry, we worry about safety and security. So we are living in gated communities. We are having more gun possessions legally. Next, we worry about, of course, is uh, something that has to do with um, uh, not, not just the you know, safety, security, but recreational needs. Our active recreation is shifting from contact team sports to more and more solo sports, such as golf. And I forecasted, ultimately, the largest growing activity will be just walking. Passive recreation, rather than watching the family shows, they may come back as reruns, but real interest is into what I call reality-based shows, not the reality of the kind that we see, like the survivors, etc., or who wants to be a millionaire, but we're really talking about reality like emergency rooms, you know, or law and order, and those kinds of programs are going to continue. That's a very interesting new life that we're living in. People, as they grow older, are bonding back with their family through generational grandparents, not through their immediate children, but their grandchildren. In fact, there's a phenomenon where grandparents are living back with their children so they can nurture and give good values to grandchildren back to extended family. And the last one is that as I grow older and especially affluent, I become much more sort of inward searching for what's the meaning of life, who I am, what we call self-actualization and spirituality. More and more books are being sold that has to do with spiritual meaning of life as we go forward. And the fastest growing religion is a Buddhism. We have done a one major demographic here, which is aging population. My view is that this itself is a massive change, especially if you look at all advanced countries, it is driving the governments and their policies. It is driving the industry and it's driving the families the same way. We will then talk about other demographics as we go further into this journey of looking at the impact of demographic trends as they affect marketing. 
Probably the most important demographic trend that impacts marketing is the emergence of working women in the US marketplace. More and more women are working, and surprisingly, the numbers are staggering. For example, in 1960, only 37% of all adult women between the ages of 18 and 68 were working outside the home. Most of them were part-time, by the way. By, 19, by 2006, this number is likely to grow to 62%. More importantly, however, the percent of women with young children working outside the family is already 75% and rising. What does this mean? It means that working outside the home will become more and more a necessity for women. This, I think, is such a significant impact. We need to analyze why it is happening and how it is going to create both marketing opportunities and challenges. The reason why more and more women are working outside the family, there is a fundamental shift in our values and attitudes since World War II. I don't think anybody has analyzed the impact of World War II in the family structure. During the World War II, all the men had gone to fight the war in Europe. Women had to manage both factories and home. Uh, I think there was a Rosie the Riveteer, for example, was a slogan or, or an icon, essentially. I think we have to understand the impact because for four years, women became both breadwinners and homemakers at the same time. When the GIs came back, we had the baby boom, highest fertility rate and all this stuff. But I think it brought about a fundamental change in the relationship between men and women or husbands and wives in the family. For the first time, women in America began to believe that they could be breadwinners also, produce children after World War II through the baby boom phenomenon, where they encouraged, especially young girls, to think about becoming economically independent rather than depend on their husband as the breadwinner and themselves as the homemakers. And I think that role change has been more significant in the US, almost a discontinuity before World War II and after World War II. And today, almost two generations have gone about, each generation making sure that the next generation of women aspire and actually want to do a career-oriented uh, you know, family as opposed to strictly being a homemaker or a housewife. In fact, today, the word housewife is considered negative. Think about that one. Nobody wants to call themselves as a housewife, which I find fascinating. More women also now go to college than ever before. And also, after they graduate, they want to have a career. This, again, is a major change. If you go back to the early days, you find that the average age of the first time marriage for women was only 17 and a half years, and for the men was 18 and a half, roughly. The girl grew up in the family. They dated in high school. If you watch the old television programs, movies, you can see this very much. Last three years, they went study in high school. And as soon as June weddings came along, because there was a June graduation, she got married, started her own family, preferably living in the same neighborhood or next to her own parents' home. And they lived happily thereafter. That is not the case anymore. Today, women are not marrying while they are going through high school graduation. They are going through college. And in between high school and college, they don't get married till after graduation. In fact, more and more, the first time marriage age for men has already increased to 28 percent, uh, 28 years in America, and for women is almost like 26 years, which means they are finding their soulmates not during high school, not in the community, but actually after college or during college and more and more at the workplace. And of course, as you know, the more standard comments and the jokes are that nowadays we find our spouse either in the laundromats where we do the laundry together or we find it on the internet. Think about the change that has taken place. They are finding more and more spouses at the workplace, for example, or in fact in neighborhoods in some fashion, not in the community in which they grew up. By the way, the biggest change that happens is when people begin to go to college, they break their umbilical cord, not only in fact with the family, but with the community. I did a study many years ago where I was absolutely fascinated to find that we have this highly mobile American society, as we call it. Census Bureau tells us that 20 to 25% of the Americans will move you know, annually. 
But then you also find the opposite statistics that 75% of the Americans will never move from the county in which they were born till they will die. In other words, what we have are two classes of people. Those who are highly mobile and those who are not at all mobile. And the key difference between those two has to do with high school versus college education. Once you go to college, you live away from the family, as far away sometimes as possible, as I find out with several of the uh, students that we teach on the, on the, in, in, in our undergraduate and graduate programs, for example. And that begins to bring about a change enormously. So I believe going to college and having a career orientation is another major factor why, in fact, you see women wanting more and more to do work outside the family, not just in the family. I also find that there are more career opportunities for women growing across professions and functions. Again, if you have a flashback again, let's say 40, 50 years ago, when women only went to high school, they aspired or they wanted by primarily job of a secretary. Some of them became nurses, some of them became teachers, and for the last two jobs, you had to do two years of college education or at least a bachelor's degree or a master's degree. Today, women are not just limiting themselves to flight attendants, secretaries, clerical work, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, they're into every imaginable uh, profession. Surprisingly, more and more women are rising as the CEOs of Fortune 500, Fortune 100 companies, and that's a fundamental change that's taking place. It is not limited strictly to management careers or professions or the categories, whether it's medical doctors. Remember, at one time, most medical doctors were men and nurses were women. Today, significant percent of medical doctors are women also. And I think that's a fundamental change. Same thing about functions. It is not strictly clerical or it is not strictly human resource management, but today women are managing factories. So there's a whole career opportunity that has again encouraged women to go to college and then start having a career as opposed to just family. Mm -hmm.